warming, two words that could mean disaster for our planet. Also, words that have become almost cliche. Can this kind of don't touch that air conditioner dial, wait while I park my SUV, blame the Chinese mentality, be heading us in a very <laughs> dangerous direction? Hello, I'm Charna Davis Wiese, and welcome to UCF in print. Now, who better to take us down this controversial and important road than, are you ready for all these credentials? Mars scientist, plasma physicist, space defense expert, true rocket scientist, author and professor, and I'm sure I've left many out, Dr. John Brandenburg. Welcome, thanks for joining us. And I, I'm sure I've left a lot of your credentials out. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> but right now, the most important Great for us, Rascal was <laughs> Great Rascal is the Dead Mars opinion. Dying Earth book. Now, I want to ask you first. Now, you've got this humongous science background. You've worked with Star Wars. You've worked with space defense. You, ha you work on fusion. Um, where'd the novel come in? Where, where did where suddenly you say, you know what? I think I'm going to be a fiction author. Where'd that come from? Uh, oh, part of it was I realized the job I'm in, I did because I read a lot of science fiction when I was young. And so, um, and, and I always wanted to write a science fiction novel. Um, but at the same time, you know, my, my big break as an author was to write a serious science book where you know I could bring all my credentials to bear on that. And that's what I was saying, with the word fiction used a little bit loosely, let's talk about a little bit of what happens to this planet, what happened to Mars. Right. We picture Mars at one time being this viable, wonderful planet with oceans, and now it's, it's, uh, there's it's, not much there. Yeah, there's, a, there's a, a song by America that says, you know, after three days in the desert, <laughs> I came to a riverbed and, and the a horse, story, didn't, horse didn't even have a name. The horse <laughs> with no name, and it says, and the story it told of the river that flowed made me sad to feel it was dead, to see that it was dead. And that's kind of how we look at Mars now. This may be a lesson for us. Absolutely. It's an object lesson. Uh, it shows that a planet can have a viable environment for life. Uh, for how long, we don't know exactly how Earth-like was it. Apparently had oceans, rivers. They weren't burning fossil fuel, fuels to cause the global warming. <laughs> yeah, well. <laughs> We're we, helping it along probably more than, than it was going on in Mars. We don't, one of the big mysteries about Mars is how long, not only did it have life on it, but how long did that life thrive? How long was Mars Earth-like? It was apparently Earth-like for some period. And a lot of people tend to say, oh, well, that, but that ended early. And the reason they say that is because over Mars now looms SETI, and uh, this is a bunch of geologists who like really talking about rocks, mm -hmm. lava types, right. and, and uh, volcanic forms and craters, and you start talking about uh, princesses going up and down uh, canals, Martian canals and barges, <laughs> they get, they get, they just, they get a little bit nervous They about get very that. nervous, <laughs> and, and it's, um, so that, the idea of a long-lived Earth-like period on Mars is actually quite scary to most Mars scientists. The only problem now is that the ocean that apparently has been identified, and I was the first person to propose this in mm -hmm. 1986 at a scientific conference, was the ocean is on the young part of Mars. Mars has a kind of dual personality. The southern half is very old and has a lot of craters. The young parts sometimes are very smooth. They look almost like terrestrial landscapes. So, and that means very young. I mean, the craters haven't had, something has gone and wiped it all clean. And uh, so all the, it hasn't had time to form more craters. And um, that's where the ocean bed is. So the ocean, if it existed, existed for most of Mars geologic history. And how about the face on Mars? Where does that take us with all of this as well? Well, that sits on the shore of what would have been the ocean. Mm -hmm. And uh, the face on Mars uh, is, of course, an extremely troublesome issue. Right now, it is probably the most photographed object on Mars because you remember that we were all waiting for new pictures of the face. They took a picture from the side and then I'm sorry, they presented it without enhancing it, so it looked like a footprint in a snowbank. Right. Once we found it, once we got the raw data and enhanced it, it had nostrils in its nose but that you couldn't see in the original pictures. And so 
it had the two eyes, nose, and a mouth, and it had other features like what looked like ornaments on the helmet. So what is that? Is that just a coincidence, or is it something created by Oh, it's by probably just Martian a coincidence, <laughs> says the government. No, the government doesn't comment on it at all. <laughs> they simply say, it's just a funny looking hill, pay no attention. It's, it's basically, move along, folks. There's nothing to see here. Kind of like in, in Oz. Pay no, pay no attention to the man pay behind no the curtain. Pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. <laughs> well, unfortunately, we live in an age where we know the government, part of the government's, the, the government feels part of its duty is to govern information, the flow of information. And, of course, they control all the pictures coming from Mars. Um, and so if the government wants to present a picture of something on Mars and wants to make it look fuzzy and uh, so it doesn't look like... We it, can't go up there to get the picture we, we want. We can't go up, yeah. And so uh, they, they eventually responded. They basically cracked under pressure and finally took a picture of it. Right. And now everybody's taking pictures of it. The Europeans are there, and the Europeans don't know the unwritten rules of this, apparently. So they're taking pictures of it. They have another probe up there called the Odyssey that's taking pictures, and the new pictures, it looks like a face again. Right. So, and people are saying, well, okay, the face looks like a face again, and the pyramid looks, the pyramid nearby looks like a pyramid. That doesn't prove anything. Don't, well, that, uh, but, it, but the, to me, what this did to me as a scientist, mm -hmm. and let me tell you something, when I got involved in that uh, investigation, I knew full well this could cost me my career. Right, there are going to be people saying, mm, John, a I little thought, bit uh... Uh, Yes, oh, really? <laughs> and um, what I decided, though, was this was back in 1984. Remember, during the Cold War, the mm -hmm. nuclear winter stuff had just come out. I was working at a nuclear weapons lab. You were working in space defense. I was working in space defense at a nuclear weapons lab. I was working on Star Wars. And starting to write a book on, the f on, on Mars. <laughs> well, uh, I didn't realize it, but I was collecting material. I didn't write the book until about 15 years later. And, but what had happened was when the nuclear winter stuff had come out, the nuclear winter, by the way, was discovered because of a dust storm on Mars. Um, Mars has taught us a lot of things over the years. Um, Mars was originally the god of war, and uh, from ancient times, uh, a lot of the technology, the metallurgy we got is from, you know, warfare from ancient times, steel, etc., bronze. Um, you don't need those things to farm, but to fight a war with a neighboring city, you like to have good, good swords, good shields, good armor. Mm -hmm. And all of this, every time Mars would appear in the sky, in, in the Mediterranean world, they would say the god of war smiles on us, just like Mars it's is above time. it. It's <laughs> time to. You wanted to. Ha you were saying uh, you wanted to have a war, uh, Paris. Uh, let's go have one. <laughs> let's uh, see what Mars says. So we've got. Or all Agamemnon he wants to attack Troy. He waits till Mars rises. So people were much more accepting about the power of Mars m m right. many eons ago. So we go to Mars finally, and there's this enormous dust storm on Mars that la it covers the planet from pole to pole for three months, and our probe is up there, slowly running out of rocket fuel, waiting for the dust to clear so it can actually take some pictures. And this was a major, major problem, in fact, so that the, um, uh, what happened was they, they launched an intense study into how a planet could actually have a dust storm that would last for three months and cover the and planet. And why. And why. <laughs> Uh, and they came up with a model of how you could get a solar-driven dust storm high in the atmosphere, and it would just stay there. Mm -hmm. Sunlight would never reach the surface. It, all, it was all upstairs mm -hmm. and up in the high-altitude uh, dust clouds. And, and then they realized, oh, my God, that could happen on Earth if we had a nuclear war because we'd had a big volcanic eruption during the 1800s, and the, the, wind, the summer just disappeared in, in uh, Europe a lot of people starved to death. Mm -hmm. I mean, people really remember that. A volcano erupting in the South Pacific, uh, Bora Bora, um, it was near Krakatoa. Krakatoa was another big explosion, but the, an even bigger one was a place called Bora Bora. And, uh, so it, they know that something like that, if it indeed happened here, right. we'd seen what had happened from just a small scale version of what was happening right. very large And then Mars. we saw that it could cover an entire planet that once this could be becoming a self-sustaining process, the dust could just stay up there at high altitude, block all the sunlight. 
And they realized that means that the initial deaths from a nuclear war, from the fallout, from the, the explosions, that would be, be really dwarfed by the deaths from starvation and cold after. So there was no way to survive a nuclear war. And I, my office mate said it most poignantly to me. He said, I used to think if we were working in a nuclear weapons facility, you know, it, it, was a, it was a government lab that one end of it, they did all the nuclear weapons research. The other end, we were doing space defense. And he said, I used to think that if there was going to be a nuclear war, I'd get the wife and kids into the car and we drive to the hills. I know what you're going to tell me. Do I want to hear this or just go put my head under the covers? <laughs> no, he said, he, being a kind of jolly fellow, he said, now I'm just going to get a six pack of beer and get up on the roof and watch the whole thing go. Might as well end it with the big bomb. Right? And I, I had, uh, so I, I waited. I didn't know what to say because he never really, he just, just didn't say things like this. Mm -hmm. and, so I said to him, what kind of beer would you be drinking? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the important thing to know. So, okay, we've got Morris teaching lessons, whether Absolutely. or not we want to learn them. <laughs> so, uh, but I want you to know that I, during the middle of the Cold War, I thought, well, what better way to end the Cold War than to find something big and exciting on Mars, you know, and uh, the best way to start a, stop a uh, barnyard brawl is the barn catches fire, and everybody works on that. We need and to work on something together. Get a distraction. Well, you have children. I have children. Distraction. <laughs> oh, look at this. <laughs> and I, I thought that if we ignore this on Mars, that suppose the chances of this being of the face on Mars and the pyramid nearby being what they look like are very, very low, given what we know about Mars. But if we ignore it, and we go on our merry way, ignoring all of this, and then blow ourselves up when we could have actually change human history by with basically a, with distracting. With a distraction that was very important. A dis, an important distraction. Uh, I, so I kind of thought very deeply and I decided, well, I'm going to risk my career, my budding career. Uh, but it didn't uh, hurt it. It didn't. It, it, well, it, put in, it, it certainly put it in a new direction. Right. And so w when we take this and we, took a, like, we look at the things that Mars can teach us and yes. we see this dead planet that may have once been very viable, even the most skeptical believe there was some form of yes. life there yes. at one time. It's becoming now, well, it's from a variety of, of sources. From We have Mars meteorites now. We have probes on Mars. We have probes circling Mars. Look how much money they're spending on Mars now. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and so it's now from a broad variety of things, it's now apparent there was life on Mars. There probably still is surviving pockets of life on Mars. That's where the Somewhere. methane is coming from. But now let's take this back here as, you, as we talk about in the book and bring it over to Earth and we talk about what's going on here. But do you think that people tend to, while we're attracted to the car wreck on the side of the street, yes. we're telling <laughs> ourselves, well, that's not going to be me. That's never going to happen right. to me. That's right. And so with global warming, do, do we think, what's going on here is that, wow, well, they're it's no, not really this that is your car bad. Wreck. You know, how do we get people to understand that, like you say, this is our car wreck? Because I tend, like I said in the beginning, to blame it on the Chinese. Whenever I talk to people about global warming, they well, it's not only our country. You know, <laughs> what can we? What if we just do it? And look what's happening here, or look what's happening there. Well, you must also realize the fossil fuel industry is a trillion dollar a year industry. And they like it that way they as we don't find out go out after of, hurricanes. I'm sorry, they don't want to go out of business. <laughs> and guess what? They have a lot of money. And Every time a hurricane comes, they have more. You'll remember <laughs> when the smoking first, the connection between smoking and cancer came out, the tobacco industry commissioned a lot of studies showing, in fact, they set up entire institutes to show that there was no connection between cancer and cigarette smoke. We're facing a similar situation here. People, the global warming is considered the G word. I mean, you... And I'll tell you, I'm, I'm a Republican myself, but I realize there's a branch of the Republican Party that thinks, well, global warming, uh, how will it affect stocks? That's all they care about. Right. But when will it come to the point that you have, you are a learned man, and when will it, you are, <laughs> admit it, when will it come to the point, what do you think it's going to take to get 
most people because you need you need a you need a big movement. How about it, a big hurricane hitting a major city on the Gulf Coast out. and basically <laughs> inundating but, it? But did that help? And causing a, a complete disaster. But did that help? Do you think people have just gone? Showing on how and said, incompetent everyone is in the face of a truly massive disaster. Right. No one looks good. And all the attention is going on whose fault was it that these levees Why are, are not the up to school buses inundated when they could have been taking people out of town? And it's another distraction, but in the wrong Why way. Why weren't more toilet plungers distributed <laughs> to the people at the Superdome right. so the toilets wouldn't back up? And the distraction's going the wrong way. Instead of looking to say what's happening with these, with these hurricanes, what's happening with the climate around the world, and we hear over and over again, it's just cyclical. It happens oh, well, that all is, the time. That, that is, <laughs> you know... <laughs> Sure, the uh, people who work in uh, smokehouses get lung cancer. That's why they got, you know, they also smoke cigarettes. Everybody smoked cigarettes back in the old days. And right. then, and then of course, you would get uh, cancers, lung cancers, but there always seemed to be workers who worked in factories who were around a lot of stuff anyway that could have given them the cancer. So, so what's it going to take for the global warming, you think, Dr. Brandenburg? Uh, I think what, hap what has to happen is we have to have an energy alternative before people, we have to have a viable energy alternative. And if that's why, in fact, at the end of the book, we proposed a crash program to harness fusion power, which is a cleaner and safer form of nuclear power. It's the same form. So we, we by the way, I would never write a book wailing about some big disaster without offering a without solution. Without a solution to it. Yeah. And what the, but the problem is it seems like the popular alternatives to fossil fuels are things that, are they really going to work on a large scale? Wind power, Wind solar power. power. Solar. It, it, it doesn't seem like it's going to make sense. No. But fusion power, when people hear, well, it's a form of nuclear en energy, you have Germany deciding to close nuclear plants by a certain date. How well, you do notice we they keep people? postponing the date. Right. How do you convince people that this is not the same with fusion? And, and, and where are we also in, in making the fusion equipment and mach machinery viable oh. to actually be able to work? Well, consider that we're spend how much we're spending on cleanup from this year's hurricane season. Right. You know, billions upon billions of dollars. And, and, and the hidden costs, I mean, that's just the government spending. How much else is being spent? And unfortunately, how much money we're spending on, you know, the war on terror in Iraq and Afghanistan, all of which was fueled by oil. So if you, you say the problems in the Gulf of Mexico and the Persian Gulf, they're both due to oil. And how much are we spending on that? You know, 300 billion probably this year, easily. And how much are we spending on fusion energy research? Less than a billion. So um, it's obvious there are a lot of choices that we are making right now, and they may not be conscious choices. Um, I worked my first, what I went into physics for, to do was to harness fusion energy. So I'm, I'm in a sense can't look, but it is the only form of power maybe that can actually should, replace fossil fuels. Maybe we should explain exactly, if it's possible in a short period sure. of time, what fusion energy is, because many well, people- Fusion energy is that when the sun rises- There it is. There it is. <laughs> that big ball of gas, what makes it so hot, that's fusion. And we can harness it and make it and we use We can it. harness it on Earth. I mean, it's, 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 they've gotten very close to, uh, you know, they, they have to take uh, very hot gas called plasma, it's a gas of electricity, and they can find it in a magnetic field, a big donut-shaped thing. It was, a to it was called a tokamak. It was invented by the Russians, by Andrei Sakharov, in fact, came up with the idea, and it works very well. Uh, they just have to build them big. It's big, expensive experiments, but they produce, they produce uh, fusion energy from them, and um, the problem is that it's a new technology. It's not very practical yet. And you, it means spending a lot of money. And you ask, how much money? Well, we might have to spend maybe $2 billion on it next year if we really want it to happen soon. And in terms of so many different things in government spending, that's not, not, not a lot of money. Well, not anymore. But convince somebody to do it. Uh, yes. <laughs> Write the and check. It's, but also, you must realize there are deep-seated economic interests that 
to keep are the not enthusiastic going. about the idea of having fusion energy. Because the less fossil fuel we have, the more money they make. The exactly. They're, they're, if, you, if you invented fusion power, whole countries who have mortgaged their oil, they're, they're not everybody owes anymore. us money. So pro, pro, they, they mortgaged their oil fields. Their oil fields are essentially their national worth. And if you harness fusion, their national worth will go down. They don't want that to happen. Um, and those countries have big investments in this country as well. Uh, exactly. <laughs> they hold a lot of our long-term treasury bonds. It's all interconnected. What you must realize is you must accept the idea that the human economy is part of the ecology of the Earth. And, and these people who say, oh, split wood, not atoms. We've got to go back to a simpler life. And you'll say, well, gee, if we stop using fossil fuel, well, they, they're, I say, carbon dioxide? We should quit making it. You know, and they're telling you this on so their cell your phone <laughs> while they're typing, they're answering their email, and then they're getting ready to go to a plane, tr on, get on an airliner, and fly to a conference on uh, on ending global warming and going back to a simpler life. Yeah, it, and, it's not going to happen. And you so don't go back. You're not going to go back. You can't go back. So are we going to have to totally run out and get to a crisis point where something is no, done? No, basically. Once the price of oil starts getting high enough. People can't afford it. Pe well, also people are going to say, uh, why don't we have any alternative energy? Why aren't we spending more on alternative We're energy? We're mad as you know what. We're not going to take it anymore. Exactly. <laughs> and and once, um, once fossil f we're running out of fossil fuels, and that means the price is going to go up. And once the price gets high enough, then people are going to go more and more to, they're going to start building nuclear power plants again. This thing, split wood, not atoms, I'm sorry. What's, what's worse, uh, carbon dioxide that stays in the atmosphere for 10,000 years or, or one ton of radioactive waste that you have to bury someplace in a secure facility, you're going to have to make hard choices. And you know, one of the one of the signs of a mature adult that separates us from being children is the ability to make mature choices and to realize that there is a downside to everything we do. They put up big windmills now, and the environmentalists don't like them anymore. Because, because they, they make they, noise. They make noise. They block the, oh, the people up in, the, up in Massachusetts, they're all for wind power, just don't build it here. Because they're too noisy and they're keeping me up at night. And the seagulls run into them. Mm -hmm. It's a big swinging propeller, and the bats run into them. It but disrupts the bird and the bat migration. And they're attracted to the noise, apparently, and then they run into the blades. And then with the solar power as well, what happens in the places that really need heat? <laughs> well, I can tell where you. Places where there's darkness for a long time. The people who work on the mirrors at solar power plants will get a higher rate of skin cancer. Okay. And they'll be suing the solar power plants. And the solar salary power plants will have to raise the prices because of the liability insurance they have to have, and the workers will have to wear <laughs> suits. So we need fusion energy. That's what we need to do. Well, we I mean, fusion energy that. is it's cleaner and safer, but it's still nuclear. I mean, you're instead of having waste that you need to bury for 10,000 years, you're going to have to bury it someplace for five years until it's not radioactive anymore. And or uh, give the carbon dioxide, but keeping I'm, the heat in and changing our climate. <laughs> you know, we have the, what I, I wanted to put this in the book, but the, my co-author wisely maybe not. <laughs> uh -oh. We have the Pol Pot wing of the environmental movement that wants 90% <laughs> of the, the Earth's population to die so that the rest of us can live in caves and go back to a simpler life. <laughs> and they say, well, gee, won't we need to have uh, build fires? <laughs> And they say, yes, that we'll build dioxide. fires out of the wood. It, we'll cut down trees and use it for firewood. And so it begins all over again. And so it again. begins all over <laughs> again. Uh, and and so, so there's that wing. And then there's the, what, what I call the country club wing of the uh, Republican Party that all it cares about is stock market. And finally, you have to convince them, if global warming happens, the stock market will go down. <laughs> it's not going to be a good thing. If we have another hurricane season, another four or five hurricane seasons like we've had, the stock market will tank. I've actually heard an economist being interviewed who said, in the long run, these hurricanes are good for the economy because it's going to stir construction, which will make people go out and buy new homes to... to <laughs> I've heard that. I live in Cocoa Beach. <laughs> I don't want any more hurricanes. I'm sorry. I, I Well, 
and there are cycles. The, uh, the, it, the example we gave in the book um, was that a person comes to an emergency room in a hospital, and they have a bad stomach ache, they're throwing up, and they have a fever. Well, they could have the flu, or they could have an appendix. <laughs> if you send them home with some aspirin, and they have the flu, that's fine. But if it's an appendix, you're If it's an appendix and their appendix bursts, then they die. So what you do, what most hospitals do, is they, they poke the person in the stomach and they say, does that hurt? And if the person says yes and they have all these symptoms, they say, your appendix is coming out. And one, um, my father was a doctor, and he said uh, they like to remove at least five healthy appendixes a year because they want to be proactive. So what you're doing is you're assessing risk, not just probabilities. Scientists are big on probabilities. What is the probability this thing in the test tube is going to do this? That's they're big because they've, they're removed from the problem. But if you're living in the test tube, then you have to talk about risk. That's the probability of something happening times the amount of damage it will create. So you want to be, you want to err on the side of caution. You, you want to err on the side of caution. This sure looks like we're going through global warming. I'm, I'm sorry, it may be a, some kind of cyclic thing on the hurricanes. Fine. Why don't we try and err on the side of, of, of... Because there are other things besides the hurricanes that are being caused that could be uh, an example of global warming. Well, not only that, we're, the human race has never occupied the planet so completely. We're cutting down the Amazon jungle. One of the big discoveries we made while writing this book was that not only is the carbon dioxide level going up in the atmosphere, the oxygen level in the atmosphere is actually dropping. It's dropping like seven parts per million per year. And I called the observatory where they measure these gases, and as it turns out, as often happens, serendipity, synchronicity, <laughs> whatever, I called this fellow up in Hawaii where they sample the air, and I said, well, uh, I've been wondering, um, you know, you guys measure carbon dioxide. What other gases do you measure? And he immediately said to me, what other gases? Uh-oh. And, and I said, well, how about <laughs> oxygen? And he had this long silence. He says, yeah, we measured it. We just got done. And I said, well, how does it compare with 1958? It's funny. I looked through these books, and I can't find any assay of the atmospheric concentration in the atmosphere except from 1958. Oh, what? And, he's, and he's, I said, what, how does it compare with 1958 levels? And the guy says, Oh, it's down. <laughs> well, you know what it sounds like, Dr. Brandenburg? It sounds like we need to go buy the beers <laughs> to That's sit there right. and watch well, it. Well, actually, you know what we did? Ending. You know what we did? We said, there's a conspiracy of silence. They're keeping it secret. But now and we're so getting it out there. And you can buy there. this book yes. and read it, and you can help with the solution. Dr. John Brandenburg, thank you so much. The book is Dead Mars. Thank you for having Dying me here Earth. to discuss this. So glad to do that. Thank you. Thank you for watching. I'm Charna Davis-Weesey. Join us next time for UCF in Print.